Okay, like you said, my name is Stacy Lindemann. I am a project forester with the National Wild Turkey Federation. I've worked for them for about four years now. Prior to um, coming back to Illinois, I'm originally from Missouri. I live down in southeastern Georgia where I worked for um, the Department of the Army as a civilian employee for them with endangered species. So I've had kind of a, a gamut of jobs. Um, I did my master's research on American kestrels. So I've worked with birds most of my life. Um, I've also had the, the pleasure of working in both wildlife and um, forestry. So my degrees are both in wildlife. However, my experience is more related towards forestry than it is towards um, wildlife. So I have um, hopefully going to talk a little bit about both wildlife and timber today. So my funding, my position is actually a grant funded position. So, and I get really nervous. So if I start talking too fast, just let me know and I'll slow down eventually. Um, my Funding is through NRCS, so I actually work through the work in the Natural Resources Conservation Service office in Moultrie County, Illinois. So I'm in Central Illinois. Uh, they provide a lot of my funding. I uh, write reforestation plans for them. So really, it's uh, anybody that wants to take bottom land out of production and put it into woods. I write those plans so we can put some tree plantings on the ground so we have more habitat. I also write forest management plans uh, for the IRAP program. It's the Illinois Recreational Access Program. It's a fairly new program through IDNR. And it's a, a program that really allows at more access to, pub, or to private land. So a private landowner can get into the IRAP program. And through that program, they allow youth, usually, to come in and hunt turkey on their property. Um, in, in return, they get a forest management plan. They get um, a small stipend. And they also get some help with the plan implementation, which is the important thing. So the plans that I actually write hopefully will get implemented and we can actually do the work on the ground for them. <clears throat> and again, I work for the National Wild Turkey Federation. So we started an initiative last year called um, Save the Habitat, Save the Hunt. In the next 10 years, we're going to conserve 4 million new acres. We're going to add 1.5 million new hunters and we're going to provide 500,000 acres of access, so public access. <clears throat> so why is this important to you? You may not be a hunter, you may not be, may care less about turkey, you may just want to be non-game, and that's perfectly fine. But this is still important to you. When you're doing good things for wild turkey, wild turkey are actually a, a generalist. They are pretty, they can live a lot of different places. They don't have to have a very specific habitat. So when you're doing good things for them, you're doing good things for quail, deer, songbirds, grouse, anything you can imagine, insects, earthworms. When you're doing good things for the turkey, you're doing good things for these other wildlife as well. You can see here from this slide, our turkey numbers are dwindling again. So we've already had to go back and release them originally um, a few years ago, and now we're, we're, we're dwindling again. The reason this is important, again, if you don't care anything about turkeys, the reason this is important when turkey numbers dwindle, so do other wildlife. So when you start losing your turkeys, you're losing your other wildlife as well. We're losing our songbirds. We're losing a, um, our quail. You know, everyone here probably knows that quail are very limited around. This is, some, you know, this, this is an indicator. This is, shows us that they're not doing well, so other species are not doing well as well. If you're not a hunter, then you, may, you could probably care less, or you think you could care less about this. Um, we're losing hunter numbers. You can see back in 1996, we had 443 hunters. 2011, we had 260,000 hunters. You good? Good? Okay. And again, you might say, why is that important to me? I'm not a hunter. I don't really care. In 1937, the Pittman-Robinson Act was put into place by the federal government. This puts a percentage, an excise tax on hunters, the products that hunters buy. That's what pays for our conservation. That is what provides the money to the federal government that gives to the state to conserve our habitat. So even if you're not a hunter, they are the ones that are paying for our conservation. So that's why it's important to us. A lot of people don't realize that. I particularly, I've, I've hunted a couple times in my life. I'm not a big hunter. My family are huge hunters. So this is why it's important to everyone in this room is because they're the ones paying for our conservation. <clears throat> okay. This is where I work in central Illinois. Oop, that's not where I wanted to do. Which one's the, there it is. I work here in the Kaskaskia River Basin. We have three focal areas for the 
Turkey, the Driftless Area, which is where we are now, the Illinois Kaskaskia River Basin, and the Shawnee Hills. So those are the three areas that we basically focus on. <clears throat> so what exactly is Ford Stewardship? It is the wise management of our resources so that we have those resources in the future. Our grandchildren have those resources. They grand, their grandchildren have those resources. We have to manage our timber so that it, re, it stays here for the future, so that our future generations still have healthy habitat. <clears throat> when people think about wildlife, these are typically what you think of. You think of your recreational and aesthetic benefits. And this is, you know, if you were to walk up to somebody and say, what's the benefit of having wildlife on your property? This is probably what they're going to tell you. Hunting, fishing, photography, wildlife viewing, bird watching, whatever it is that you'd like to do with wildlife. <clears throat> what we don't often think about are the ecological benefits of having wildlife on your property. So without wildlife, without insects, your flowers are not going to be pollinated. Without earthworms, the soil is not going to be regenerated. Without bats, we're going to have millions and millions and millions more mosquitoes now than what we have. So, and then the blue jay there is an excellent seed disperser. This is how the wildlife help out the environment as well. So without the wildlife being there, without the diversity of wildlife being there, these ecological benefits aren't there as well. So there's more to having wildlife on your property than just hunting or fishing or, you know, looking at them. There's a lot more that goes on out there in the habitat. There's four basic succession, successional stages of um, a forest. You have your stand initiation stage, which is when it starts to go into seedlings. So you'll have a grass field that hasn't been burned or hasn't been plowed, and you're going to start seeing some seedlings growing up in there. And then you have your stem exclusion stage. It's the next size up. Those trees are going to start excluding each other, going to start being so crowded that they can't get enough light. Some of those are going to start to die. You have the understory reinitiation. That's when you start getting some gaps in your canopy, and you're going to have some young plants start coming into those areas. Can you guys hear me in the back still OK? Yeah? OK. Um, the old growth forest, when you have the large and overmature tre over trees, uh, we don't have a lot of what, you know, technical old growth forest that's never been harvested, but we have a lot of overmature trees out here. <clears throat> the reason is that succession is important is that the wildlife habitat changes as the succession changes. So if you don't do something to set that succession back, that, su that wildlife or that habitat is changing on a yearly basis. So if one of the most common things I hear from a landowner is, 30 years ago, I had quail on my property, or 30 years ago, I had this on my property. I haven't done anything. You know, it's still exactly as it was 30 years ago. I don't have them anymore. Why is that? Well, it's not the same. So it has changed. You may not see it that way, but the habitat has actually changed, and the wildlife no longer have what they need. So by not doing anything, you are not setting that succession back. So. You have to actually do something to keep the successional stage where you want it to be for whatever wildlife you're trying to, to keep on your property. <clears throat> there are four components of um, habitat that all wildlife need. They need food, water, cover, and space. Pretty, pretty simple. Your food is going to depend on several different things. First, your forest successional stage. Where are you in that gradient? Are you at the standing initiation stage? Are you at the old growth stage? Where exactly are you on that gradient? That's going to determine what type of food is out there. Local climate. And that's not just, let's say, central Illinois. That means, is it on top of a hill? Is it on the southern slope? Is it on the northern slope? Where exactly is that plant located? Where are you talking about? And of course, which season? There are several ways to improve um, wildlife habitat and wildlife resources, or the food resources. Um, increase sunlight to your forest floor. That's one of the main things that we have an issue with in central Illinois, and I'm assuming up in this area as well, is that we're not getting enough sunlight to the forest floor. We have overcrowded forests. There's not a whole lot that's going on down underneath of it. You can release those hard mass trees, the oaks, the hickories, the walnuts. You can release those, and that's going to improve their nut production. Wildlife friendly trees, you can release those as well. So they may not do anything for your timber value, but they're going to do a lot for your wildlife value. 
leaving snags. Snags is just a standing dead tree. Those are excellent places for food. So you have insects that uh, go in and they start to eat the trees and then you bring in the, the woodpeckers that eat the insects and then the hawks that eat the woodpeckers. It ends up being a, a, a food chain, a food web on those trees. Increase plant and tree diversity, plant for all seasons, edge feathering and prescribed burns. I'm going to talk about both edge feathering and prescribed burns here in a minute. <clears throat> Another key component is water. You know, they, uh, everybody needs water, so we have to have clean, healthy water. Uh, one of the best ways to improve your water resources is to keep livestock out of it. So that's, that's pretty general. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't happen a lot. We have a lot of livestock, at least in my area, that are you know, walking through the streams and through the creeks. But if we can keep the livestock out of it, it still does a lot better. Protect your, tim uh, protect your forest, your water resources, while you're doing timber harvest and TSI. If you're going to be bringing in some heavy equipment, try to make it during the um, fall or winter time when the ground's frozen. That way you're not going to be, um, you're not going to be damaging the, the soil as much. And that includes riding like ATVs through creeks and stuff. You don't think about it that much, but if you're you know, riding up and down the creek, you're, you're disturbing a lot of habitat. <clears throat> One of the best ways of protecting your water resources is right here. We have trees along these rivers that are called buffer strips. Every creek and every river should probably have a buffer strip on it. If you look at the bottom picture, you can see that the erosion is great here. It's, you know, it's grass right up to it, short mowed grass. You can see that river bank is washing away. Also, up here, you're going to have some shade on those, on those creeks. Those creeks and rivers, they need to be cool for the, the invertebrates to live in them, for the fish to live in them. They're, they need a certain temperature. By taking the trees away, you're not shading those, those creeks any longer, and those temperature gets too high. And then the invertebrates there aren't there any longer. The fish aren't there any longer. So it's, a, it's another way that we protect them. In central Illinois, we have, um, very fragmented forests, and I'm assuming it's the same here and everywhere where probably most of you guys live, is we have very, very fragmented forests. We have, you know, 20 acres here, our neighbor has 30 acres here, you know, I have 100 acres here, whatever it is, but there's no way for wildlife to travel between those patches of woods. So they have to live just in that one patch or they have to cross a big field, which they don't like to do. This is an excellent way for them to be able to travel between different forestry or different forests. So if you provide some buffer strips for them, they give, it gives them a place to travel where they feel safe, where they get some, they can have food, they can have shelter, they can have water, they can have everything they need to travel from one spot to the next to find more food. Covers another one of the key components. And this isn't just from the top. So a lot of times we think about it or from the sides. You need to have both vertical and horizontal cover. If you think about it, if you're a turkey poult running through the woods, you have owls and hawks that can get you, you have coyotes, you have uh, bobcats, all of that. You have to have it from the top and from the sides. So you need to be both vertical and horizontal structures. It also provides great places for um, them to escape from predators. You need to be able to have somewhere for them to go. And the shelter from winter, basically, from adverse weather conditions. I know I wouldn't want to be out there in the woods without any protection from the wind. Neither do these guys. They need somewhere they can go where they can stay warm, somewhere they can get into a den tree, a hole, a, a down log, you know, something that they can get into, hide behind, stay warm. <clears throat> ways you can improve cover, brush piles. So are excellent ways to improve cover on your, um, on your property for small mammals, for rabbits, for snakes, for, you know, herps. Um, hinge cuts and edge feathering, mean, those go along with the brush piles. You can do um, both of those. Travel corridors, again, that goes back to the buffer strips. And you can improve the understory, which is something that we really need to be doing here in, in the Midwest, is improving our understory. Provide den trees. These are the areas, again, that, you know, they, the, the snags. We want to make sure we leave those snags out there and the down trees. So let's say if you have a timber harvest, they leave the tops out there. Those tops are excellent for wildlife. 
So if you cut a tree down, leave it out there. It may not look pretty, but it, it's an excellent place for wildlife. Space is probably the hardest component for us to manage. Um, the larger the animal, the bigger the size of the home range typically. And depending on what their diet is, de determines what type of or how big of an area they need. This goes back to the buffer strip. Uh huh. Can you not hear me? Wait till the end if you don't mind. Thank you. Um, the best way to, include, uh, to improve space is to improve quality of habitat. So it, the, the better your quality of habitat, the less space you need. So say if you have a high quality habitat, high quality woods on your property, you can keep a lot more animals in those woods. They're not going to be traveling to your neighbor's woods as much because they, they have everything they need right there. So the higher quality habitat you have, the less space they need. So that's really one of the best ways for us to, to prove that. Um, again, improve quality of habitat, travel corridors. So if you have you know, a wood plot here on your property and another wood plot over here, make a way for them to travel between the two of them without you know, having to cross a big field. Um, the best thing, of course, would be to have large contiguous tracts of managed land. But, you know, that, that's, that's a little difficult to come by here in Illinois, so. <clears throat> I'm going to talk mainly about concerns in Illinois. I assume it's going gonna, it's gonna to all relate to everyone in here, no matter where you live. It's going to be pretty much everywhere in, mid, in the Midwest. Our biggest concern, or one of our biggest concerns, is um, invasive species. So I'm sure everyone here has probably dealt with them on their property. There's not a whole lot. You know, not a whole lot of properties out there that don't have them. If you don't have them now, you're going to get them. It's just the way it is. So, um, and the biggest problem with the invasive species is that they're displacing our native ground cover. So you have a, you can see here on these um, pictures, especially like this one, this is bush honeysuckle in the woods. There's no way anything else can grow underneath of that. So although the, the animals do eat, you know, people tell me, well, they ate the berries. Well, yeah, they do. You're right, they do. And that's one of the ways it travels from one place to the next. However, there's nothing on the ground underneath of that. If you look underneath a batch of bush honeysuckle, there's nothing there. That includes your insects, like the turkey poults need, the, um, the earthworms that are going to be regenerating your soil. Everything else, all those other ecological benefits that we were talking about aren't there. So we need to have... Um, native ground cover here. We need to have good browse layers. We need to have something that's supposed to be there so we can have the regeneration that we need of the woods and the, the species that we need there for all of the insects and all of the, um, the wildlife. That's multiflora rose, garlic mustard, and then Japanese honeysuckle. We'll talk more about those here in a minute too. Another one of the major concerns in our area, I work in an oak hickory area, so um, overcrowding of oak hickory forests. So if I go up to a landowner, you know, they'll start talking and they'll say, well, I, I have lots of oak and hickory. Okay, that's great, that's awesome. But you have it in your canopy. We don't have it in our understory. So if I walk out to your property and we have a lot of large oak hickory trees, that's awesome. However, 99% of the properties I walk onto don't have oak hickory in the understory. There's not the young oak and young hickory. What we have are soft maple, or um, soft seeded species, maples, elms. That's what's gonna replace our oaks and our hickories when our oak and hickory die, because there aren't any young ones anymore. So this is a huge problem. This is something that we really need to start paying attention to, because in the future, we're not gonna have the oak hickory forest like we have now if we don't start managing them. <clears throat> This is just a picture of a closed canopy forest. It's a pretty young forest. Um, it's the best one I could find. But you can see up here in the top where the canopy is, there's no holes. It's closed. There's no sunlight that's getting to the forest floor. If you look down here at the bottom, there's just, there's no ground cover, which means if you go back to the, to the ecological benefits, there's no insects, there's no earthworms, there, you know, there's no place for cover here for wildlife to survive. So there's no food. They're not going to want to be in here. If they do, they travel through here. So a lot of forests that I go out on are like this. They kind of look like a park. They're nice to walk through. I like to do you know, my timber management out there because I can walk really easily. I'm not tripping on stuff. I'm not falling over. Um, it's easy. But this is not what, want, what wildlife want. 
<clears throat> this is going to be a picture of an, op op an open canopy forest. You can see up here in the, the canopy, we have a lot more room, a lot more sunlight that's going to be coming through. If you look at the vegetation on the ground, we have a lot of different types of vegetation here. This is really what we want to have in our forests. So how do we do this? How do we get that to look like that? <clears throat> The first step that we always recommend is to have a forest management plan written. This is what I do, um, you know, for my, in my job. This is what I do. I write forest management plans. So it basically what I do is I come out to your property um, and I'll, what they call cruise the timber. I'll look at the timber, look what's out there. I take a bunch of different points across the whole, you know, across your property. And I take all that data back and I put it into a computer and it spits out a bunch of statistics to me. Um, and then I can manage your property using those, that, those data points. So it's going to tell me if you have too many trees. It's going to tell me if you have um, not enough ground cover. It's going to tell me if you have young trees versus old trees. It's going to tell me all that information. And then I can take it back and I can tell you what you need to do to improve your habitat. It should lay out your goals, what you as a landowner want to do. Are you interested in wildlife? Are you interested in timber? Are you interested in both? You know, what are your goals? What do you want to do in the future? Uh, it should present you with your management recommendations. Okay, these are your goals. This is how we're going to get there. This is what we're going to do to get to that point. <clears throat> and basically, a uh, management plan is good for 10 years. So it's going to tell you what you need to do over the next 10 years. These are my typical recommendations. This is basically... What, if I come out to your property, these are what I'm going to recommend. Harvest mature trees, timber stain improvement, prescribed burns, exotic species control, interplanting and edge feathering. <clears throat> Take a drink real fast. <clears throat> okay, this is one of my biggest things too is um, if you're going to harvest your timber, please, please, please use a consulting forester. Don't harvest timber without one. I would use one. I would hire one myself and I know a little bit about this. So they are there to protect you, the landowner, from being high graded, from, um, they're there, they're going to help you reach the goals that you want. They're going to get you the money that you deserve for your timber. They're going to help you reach those goals. So this is something I've been on way too many properties where somebody has come up to the door and offered them X amount of dollars, which sounds like a lot of money. And then I go out to the property and what we end up having to do is the only thing I can recommend is a whole new ring planting of oaks because they're gone. And this has happened on many, many occasions. So anyways, please hire a consulting forester. They usually take about 10% and you will make more than that back. That's just mine be on timber harvesting. Um, if you do a timber harvest, leave some of those old woofy trees, the ones that are out there, the huge ones that have branches everywhere, they put off a lot of acorns. They give a lot of seed out there. You can take some of them, you know, but just make sure you leave some of them out there as well. They're excellent den trees as well. Usually they'll have some holes and cavities in them, you know, somewhere along the line. Um, they're excellent den trees, excellent wildlife trees. Again, harvest in late fall or winter, when possible, particularly if you're in an area that's wet because you want that ground to be frozen. You don't want to be sinking into the ground with that heavy equipment. Um, it does a lot less damage than when, when you do it. And, you know, a lot of hunters will say, well, I'm not harvesting in the winter or in the fall. <laughs> well, if you want to be able to hunt later on, you, you should harvest in the fall or the winter. So anyways, um, leave your snags and standing dead trees. Um, maintain diversity in the canopy. Again, this is, you know, goes back to don't harvest all of your oaks and your hickories and your walnuts. You know, don't take everything that's out there. Leave some of it out there so that you have some again. In, you know, 20 years, you can do another harvest. You know, whatever, whatever it is, whatever your goals are. Um, just make sure that there's some still left out there. You can plant those logging decks where they drag the trees up to. You can plant those into food plots, green fields, whatever it is that you want. So those are great openings, wildlife openings. <clears throat> and most importantly, don't high grade. High grading is taking all the good trees out. So I, I won't harp on that any longer, but I've just, I've just seen it too many times 
that um, I've gone to a property and there's just nothing left. <clears throat> Timber stain improvement. This is one of my favorite ones. And I, I'll, basically I'm going to explain what a timber stain improvement is. Is really that top picture is you can see this is what our forests typically look like here. Crowded. There's nothing. There's no sunlight. Those canopies are touching. So I'm talking about the canopies of the trees where the leaves are. They're touching each other. They're intermixed. There's no sunlight coming through the forest. And that's a big issue because the plants on the ground need to have sunlight. Oak and hickory and walnut need sunlight to regenerate. So they will, the acorns will pop, so you'll have a, a small oak. Within two years, though, they're going to die because they don't have enough sunlight. So what we do is we come in, we take out the trees that we don't want, the low fork trees, the crooked and limmy trees, the crowded trees, the poor species trees. So you come in and you take out whatever trees that it is that you don't want in there. You leave the good ones. You leave the, the wildlife-friendly trees. You leave the, the high timber harvest trees, the ones that you're trying to, um, that you want to harvest down the line. And this is what you end up with afterwards. End up with these big gaps in the canopy. This is what we want to have in our, in our forest. We want to have these gaps where that sunlight can come in and get to the, for the ground on the forest. <clears throat> Those trees that you release in that TSI can put a lot more of their energy into the crown growth. So they're going to get a big full crown. A big full crown means a lot of acorns, a lot of walnut shells, a lot of hickories. Whatever, you know, whichever tree it is, they're going to have a lot more of that fruit. Um, being produced off of that as well. They're going to mature faster. They're going to grow faster. You're going to be able to harvest those trees faster. Which, you know, whatever it is that you want to do with it, it's going to get there quicker because they can put more energy into it. They're not competing with other trees to get the, the nutrients, the sunlight. And these are just some quick uh, um, excerpts from a, a crop tree management. The, in an average year, a tree that has been released, a white oak, is going to produce seven times more acorns than a tree that's not been released. In a poor year, a red oak is going to double its acorn production. That's one that has been released. So that's dramatic. I mean, that's a big change. So if you're looking to have wildlife on your property or have better timber on your property, whatever your, your management goals are, this is going to help you reach them. <clears throat> It increases your sun, the sunlight to the forest floor. Again, it's going to give you a browse layer. It's going to give you the vegetation on the ground that you need so that you're going to have that wildlife, so that you have the insects that are going to bring in your turkey poults, so you have the, the vegetation the deer are going to eat, so that you have the, the cover that the, the rabbits need. Whatever it is that you're trying to get on your property, you, it's going to help you reach that goal. The park-like, you know, that park-like forest, isn't going to bring any animal in, maybe, maybe a raccoon. So, you know, if you want to have a variety of different types of wildlife out there for your viewing or whatever, hunting, whatever it is, you need to have a TSI. <clears throat> you can use the cold trees for firewood. I have a lot of guys that'll do that. They'll come in, you know, especially the trees on the outer edges of them, take it in and burn it. That's, that's fine. That's great. Um, you can create snags and brush piles for wildlife cover. You know, take some of these small trees that you pile them up. It's, it's easy to do. Great place for rabbits. You know, an excellent place for, for them. A great place for herps. And I know a lot of people don't like snakes, but great place for snakes to live as well. Just don't stick your hand in there. Um, it's going to produce more dead and down on the floor. So dead and down is just, a, just timber that's laying on the ground, whatever it is that's falling over. <clears throat> Invasive species. Again, it replaces the, um, the native species, the herbaceous plants. We want to get control of our invasive species prior to any type of canopy release. You don't want to go into a, a property that has invasive species on it, open up the canopy, because those invasive species are going to explode. So really what I do recommend is at least a three-year control. If you have light invasive species, you can do it at the same time. I don't, it, very few people I recommend that to. Usually you have to have less than 10% ground cover in invasive species to do it at the same time. That's not much um, invasive species. But if you open up the, <coughs> excuse me, if you open up the canopy prior to that, you're going to explode those invasive species and then you're going to really have an issue from then on. Let me get a drink.
<coughs> so make sure you get control. And control you're always going to be fighting these. These are not going to go away. You're not going to be able to get them out of your forest ever, you know, that you have zero. So vigilance. I always recommend to my landowners, take a squirt bottle with you. Stick it on your belt. Walk through the woods. As you see them, squirt them. You know, pull them up. Take a trash bag with you. Pull them up. Take them out of the woods with you. Particularly garlic mustard. If you get a garlic mustard, take it out of the woods. You leave it out there, it's still going to spread. <clears throat> Invasive species are much easier to identify. If you're not very good at identifying plants, the best time to do it is early spring and late fall. Anything that's green, early spring or late fall, is pretty much an invasive species. So as you drive down the road and you know, pretty soon, I'd say probably in the next two weeks, and you'll start seeing green out there, it's probably an invasive species. So, you know, and then and you can spray them then at that time. It's a good time to do it as well because your, your native species aren't up, so if you're spraying them with Roundup or whatever, you're not killing all the natives as well, you're killing just the, the invasive species. The five main ones that I have um, in the woods in central Illinois are garlic mustard, which is a herbaceous plant, um, spreads very easily. Um, it's a two-year cycle, so you'll see the rosettes first, and in the second year you actually get the seed production. Japanese honeysuckle is a vine. Uh, it will take over your woods. It will take over areas of your woods and it'll kill the trees. It'll, <laughs> it, you won't be able to walk through it. It's a mess. It smells wonderful. That's how it got here because it smells wonderful. Bush honeysuckle, I'm assuming most people are probably familiar with that if, you have a land, if you're a landowner. It's probably the most common one we have. Um, Multiflora rose, again, real common doesn't spread as quickly as honeysuckles do or um, garlic mustard, but it's still, you still want to get rid of it. Autumn olive is more of an edge species or more of a field species, but I do find it in my, I find it a lot in my tree plantings. So if you have a tree planting, if you're trying to bring it back, you're going to find these in your tree planting. And you probably have different ones, you know, up here in the northern areas than I have down in um, central Illinois. But for the most part, they're going to be the same, the same concepts are going to apply to any invasive species. You're going to want to control them before you do any work in the canopy. That, that's all going to relate to no matter where you are, which one it is. <clears throat> Prescribed burning, and this is one of our cheapest, most underused tools that we have. When I worked in Georgia, we burned, um, we burned thousands of acres at a time. We burned with a helicopter. We burned the hot as we possibly could. That's not what we want to do here. Here we want to burn low temperatures. We want to burn in the woods in the, um, in the, in the fall, early spring. It's going to set back your succession. If you go back to those successional stages we were talking about earlier, it's going to set that back to where you want it to be. You're not going to have the, over, the overabundance of, um, of the soft-seeded species that you, you see if you don't burn. It's going to set, you know, a couple years after a uh, exotic control. It's going to help to burn up some of those, the, the stuff that's still standing out there. You want to get rid of some of that. It's going to manipulate your plant communities. You can burn at different times of the year and decide what's going to come up. So you can, you can adjust that burn time to what you want to do in your woods. <clears throat> the best time to do a burn is in conjunction with the TSI, a timber harvest, exotic control. It doesn't do a lot of good just to go out and throw a match out in the woods and let it burn. You need to be doing other management purposes as well. So you need to do it in conjunction with your other management purposes. The head fires are the ones that, like I said, we used in Georgia when I was down there. That's what we used were head fires. We wanted it hot. I worked in a longleaf ecosystem, longleaf pines, and they had to have hot fire for their, <coughs> their cones to even open up. Um, here we use backfires. So we want it to be a slow burning, slow moving, to the point of where you are bored to death to be out there. I mean, it, <laughs> you're sitting out there, you're like, this is, this is ridiculous. So um, that's, that's what you want it to be here in Illinois or in the Midwest, is you want it to be a slow burning, low temperature fire. Those oaks can withstand that. The hickories can withstand that. Their bark is made for it to burn. So the maples, the elms, the, the trees that we're trying not to have out there, the honey locusts, they're not going to be able to withstand that. If you burn off oak regeneration, 
typically your roots of those oaks are going to st are going to still survive and they're going to put a new shoot up in the spring so even if the oak regeneration is not going to be damaged so much you're going to get new shoots in the spring um, so this is you know I, it it looks scary because most people see you know the the pictures from that from out west and you know the huge backfire the flames that's not what we're trying to do here it's really really like I said, it's, it's almost boring where you're like, I mean, are we ever going to get done? So we do use strip fires sometimes when, we have, <laughs> when it's going really, really slow. Or if you have, don't have a whole lot of fuel. And that's just so you go in and you put a few strips in just to have a short head fire so that it burns a little quicker. <clears throat> but it is one of our, it's, probably, it's the most underutilized tool that we have and the cheapest tool that we have. It's going to promote your herbaceous understory. It's going to give you that understory that you need to have the earthworms, the insects, the, the browse layer. It's going to give you all that. It's going to promote oak regeneration. If you think about it, the seeds of oaks, the seeds of other plants, anything that you, it needs to actually have contact with the dirt to regenerate. When you have a big leaf litter on the ground, those seeds are typically not going to get down into the dirt unless something puts it there or if it just manages to squeak down in there. When you burn it, it's going to give a chance for, those, for that soil contact. So it's going to really increase the number of herbaceous, or herbaceous plants out there, the number of oak regeneration that's out there, because it actually gets soil contact. This is just some oak regeneration that was burned up. As you can see, it came right back. It can help with control of your invasive species as well. Now, you're not going to be able to go out there in uh, a forest that has a 100% you know, cover of bush honeysuckle and burn it up and it's going to be gone. It, it, it unfortunately doesn't work that way. However, if you start managing your invasive species, this can be a tool that you can use to help you get control of it, to help you manage it. If it's real high, you come in and get, if you can get it to burn, which typically it's hard to um, when it's high, but you can start, it, it'll help you get a control of it or it will help you keep control of it in the future. <clears throat> Usually we recommend you burn um, following some type of um, timber harvest, tree thinning, whatever it is, about two to four years later. That gives a chance for everything that's out there to die. Uh, your invasive species are going to be dry, you know, the, the, the shells of them, the, the stems that are still standing. Your trees are going to be on the ground. You know, some of your limbs are going to have fallen. It's going to help clean it up a little bit in there. And it's also going to help to control these soft-seeded species that have flushed. So not only will your invasive species flush after you open up the canopy, these elms and maples are going to flush as well because they're getting more sunlight too. So they have less uh, competition as well. It's going to help to control those so that you're not going to have to go in and do as much work down the line when you have to take out these elms and maples. And usually if you burn every four to five years, that usually keeps a very, pretty good over, understory. It's going to depend on your forest and what type of fuel load you have in your forest. Um, the hardest part is getting a good fuel load so that you can do that. But if you have a, if you have a good, solid, healthy forest every four to five years, it, it keeps it pretty good. Um, keep your snags in your den trees, of course, like we've talked about that a little bit already. 17 of 45 species of North American bats live in our shag, um, live in our, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> live in our, um, in our snags and our, the sluffling bark. Those shag bark hickories are awesome places for um, bats to roost. I was just told I need to hurry up. So the cavity nesting is you know, great for pestering birds, owls, wood ducks, a bunch of different species of animals will use these cavities as places to, to survive. The edge feathering technique is something that um, I mentioned a little bit ago. Really what it is, is a transition zone. You don't really want to have a hard edge. You don't want to go straight from a forest or straight from a field to a forest. So that's difficult on the wildlife. It doesn't increase the, um, the, it, the edge feathering is going to increase the vegetation out there. It's going to increase the food resources. It's going to increase the cover resources. This is a picture of what we do in, for an edge feathering technique. In our area, the, the forests are pretty small. So I have a hard time recommending anyone to go in and cut 100% of their trees down on the edge. So really, what I usually recommend is we take a portion of a field and make it, um, it part of the edge feathering. So you start letting that portion of the field start growing up. 
So that would be the 75%. So if you have a large tract of forest, then it may not be such a big deal, but I have a hard time telling somebody to do that when we have a 20 acres to work with to begin with. On the second section, which is usually, usually about 30 feet per um, section is how we usually try to do it, is you take out about 50% of the trees. So you're going to have a basal area of about 35 to 50 is what you're going to be left with. The basal area, um, we really want it to be normally around 70 in the Oak Hickory Forest. So you want it to be about half of that. And then the next 30 feet, you're going to take 25% of those trees out. So as you can see, we're just really making a, a gradient so that that's not such a hard edge, that there, there's going to be vines, there's going to be briars, there's going to be food, there's going to be places for these animals to go. This is excellent for quail. So if you were, you know, this is one of the techniques we use for quail. Excellent place for turkey poults. <clears throat> this is just a picture of a place that's been edge feathered. You can see here, this is going to be that first zone. They've cut all these trees down in here. The next zone out here. And typically we'd have a high canopy back here. But this is an area, that's just, this is just a young forest. So as you can see, there's just, it, it, it's not that hard edge where you have field and then forest. It gives it a much more a softer gradient, something that they can work with a little better. Hinge cutting is something that we do as well. Uh, we do this a lot in the, in the um, edge feathering and in areas that we want to have a living brush pile. So you can cut the tree when you're chainsawing, you cut it halfway through, let it fall over. That thing's going to stay alive and you're going to have green leaves on it. You're going to have a living brush pile for those animals to get into. It's going to provide food. Gives them a place to live, a place to get out of safety. If you're real good, you can drop it on top of your brush piles. Drag all the brush into one area, do this on top of it, and you got an excellent brush pile. <clears throat> so just a couple pictures of some trees. You can see they're going to re-sprout up in here. It's going to, you know, that's going to give them some areas there. This is just all dropped around. So that's just called hinge cutting. That's something that we do as well. Um, I'll touch on this real quickly. Interplanting is something I try not to ever have to do. This is something I never want to do. This is, goes back to the high grading to an area that doesn't have um, the, the species we want or an area that's not been managed and has already gone into all sugar maple or all elm. This is when you go in and you have to put um, trees. We have to go in and replant a forest underneath of the canopy that's already there. So this is something I'd, it's expensive, it's time consuming, it's a lot of work, so we don't want to get here to begin with. We want to manage our timber properly so that we're not here. If we do it, this is basically what it ends up looking like. We end up having to take, um, we take the basal area down pretty low so you have a pretty open canopy, and then we plant these trees in there amongst it. And those are um, deer shelters, tree shelters on those that we can protect a little bit more from deer. So, but like I said, that's something that we don't particularly want to do. I find it in a lot of my plans, um, depending on, you know, er, sometimes we can do an acre or two, you know, and, and that's not such a big deal, but when I have to go in and replant an entire, an entire forest, that's really bad. And unfortunately, I've had to recommend that several times. <clears throat> okay, this is going to be just some quick pictures. This is an overstocked hickory forest. So this is what most people's property looks like when I walk out there, or it's filled with um, invasive species, but this one's so thick. Um, that not even invasive species are growing underneath of it. So th this is a winter picture, unfortunately, so you can't see the canopy um, that it's closed. But that's what I see a lot of times. It's a picture of a TSI, a tree that is girdled. Those big trees, we want to girdle those trees. We want to wrap it around with a chainsaw, um, and then you're going to spray it. <clears throat> this goes in you know, about two inches or so. You take a chainsaw, to run it completely around, make sure those points touch. They have to touch. And then you can spray directly into that. A lot of the white oaks will actually graft roots. So if you have two white oaks that are next to each other, double girdle them and don't spray them. Because if you kill the one with the spray, it could transfer to the next white oak next to it and you could kill the one you're trying to save. So <clears throat> you can also see all these little trees laying down on the ground. That's, you take the small ones, you drop them. So we, you're going to girdle and you're going to drop, depending on how big they are. This is what you're trying to create, that canopy gap, that opening in the forest. You're going to leave that standing tree there, that's your snag that you want. Two years later, we're going to come in and burn it. Again, you can see how low these um, flame heights are. This is a slow burn. 
this is what it's going to look like. So if you think back to that picture where there was nothing on the ground, this is two months after a spring burn. So you can see all of the, you know, there's plenty of places for the insects to be. There's plenty of places. There's a huge diversity. There's places on the ground. You can see, actually see dirt down in here, soil. There's places where that, they're going to get that soil contact when the acorns actually touch the ground, and we're going to get some regeneration in as well. These are some um, species that are beneficial to wildlife. That's just my turkeys. So that's it. So, um, okay, I think I'm done. We can take some questions. You have a lot of elm regenerating. Mm -hmm. Is it best just to go in and cut them all off? That's usually what we do. Yes, right. we. He asked if there, if you have elm, a lot of elm regeneration. If it's best to cut it off, yeah. Usually that's what we do is we go in and cut it down, do a little spray. Yeah, spray it, just like well, it, there's other hickories and oaks in there. Yeah, you, a tremendous amount of elm. Um, you can. You, Elm doesn't re-sprout as easily as some of the other ones, so you could probably, get, depending on how big it is, you could probably get away with, yeah, you could probably get away with just cutting it and leaving it. Um, make sure you open up your canopy then so that you can start getting some of that oak regeneration in there as well. So, yes? Yes. 